When Yuri Gagarin looked down, he saw a sight no human had ever seen with their own eyes. Earth. We'd seen drawings of what it potentially looked like, and images via satellite, but now we knew for sure the appearance of our blue marble. His orbit of the Earth in 1961 made him the first human in outer space, and was an integral moment in the space race which had captured the world at this point. The mid 20th century saw the world locked in the Cold War. This period of tension spotted with occasional fighting, pitted the USA and USSR against one another as they both attempted to assert themselves as the world's leading superpower in the aftermath of the Second World War. This was also influenced by their political ideologies of communism and capitalism for the USSR and USA respectively. Each side wanted their ideology and influence to spread as much as possible and to be the world's default. The battle grew so intense that just bickering over the planet itself did not suffice. Space became a theatre for the USA and USSR to show off their technological prowess. It was also thought that having claim over parts of space could give them an upper hand strategically. Satellites could detect what was going on in enemy soil, so ruling over space allowed your missiles to fly freely. In some ways, the space race was the next evolution of the age of colonization that came centuries before it. Powers wanting to plant their flags and assert their influence in lands that were previously unreachable. This would logically mean languages reaching places that words had never been uttered before. A huge round of mythology has seemingly been built up around Gagarin and what he said during his orbit. One thing we know for sure he said is, let's go, as his ship launched. It's after this that things get a little murky. The line, I see no gods up here is often attributed to him, but there's no actual evidence he ever said this. Other quotes like, I see earth, it's so beautiful, and the earth is blue, how wonderful, are linked with him too. A translated log of his communication back with earth during his flight shows us none of these quotes appear exactly. He did however, talk about how blue and wonderful the earth looked from space. He also commented on faults he saw in the terrain and the blue halo which appeared over earth as he floated around it. It was these humble musings as opposed to one prophetic line which were the first words uttered in space and the language they were uttered in was none other than Russian. Russian is the most widely spoken of all Slavic languages. The tongue sits on the Balatov Slavic branch of Indo-European and hasn't migrated too much outside of its own vast borders. Nearby nations like Belarus and Kyrgyzstan have given it official status. But Russian never found its way to being a dominant tongue in the New World, nor did the language gain any grounds during the scramble for Africa or anything like that. Russia didn't play a large role in the age of colonization for a variety of reasons, but when you already have a nation that dwarfs all other countries on the planet, you probably have enough to worry about without thinking about overseas claims. When Gagarin flew into space, the country we know as Russia today didn't exist. Instead, the aforementioned USSR stood in its place which contained the modern Russia and more land that forms other nations today. The Russian language's furthest migrations, however, weren't across the Atlantic or in the depths of the Southern Hemisphere, but instead into the skies. Since Yuri's first flight, Russian has had a key role in the realm of outer space linguistics. Yet, it wouldn't stay as space's only tongue for all that long. Just because the USSR had gotten someone into space did not mean the race was over. In fact, the feat only made the USA more driven to be the ultimate winners. Less than one month later in 1961, the USA launched their very own Alan Shepard into the heavens. He is not only the second person ever in space, but the first American and first English speaker. The story goes that, during his flight, Shepard coined the term AOK, -okay, which has since become deeply linked with spaceflight. In reality, this was said by someone else after his flight in relation to how it went. Shepard did speak during his travels, communicating on all manner of things to ground control. This meant that English had arrived in space along with Russian and, for some time, these were the only two languages spoken in the void. Across the 1960s, the USA and the USSR attempted to outdo one another in the space field. A culmination of sorts happened in 1969, as it was in this year that the feet of humans stepped out onto land that wasn't Earth for the first time. Neil Armstrong became the first human on the moon, shortly followed by Buzz Aldrin. In a short, four-year period between 1969 and 1972, 12 people found themselves walking on the moon, and since then, no one has been back. 
Of these 12 people, a resounding 100% of them are American, meaning the only language to have ever been spoken on the moon specifically is English. Beyond the moon, across wider space, more linguistic diversity emerged. People from other parts of the world found themselves launched into the stratosphere. In 1978, Czechoslovakian political figure and cosmonaut Vladimir Lumek became the first person in space not from either the USSR or the USA. This would have made Czech, of all tongues, the third language ever spoken in space. Since Yuri Gagarin was shot into the heavens, 48 nations have sent people into space with their respective languages tagging along for the ride. Some of these space-faring nations don't even exist anymore, like the USSR, as well as East and West Germany. This means that besides English, Russian and Czech, other languages that have been spoken in space include European tongues like French, Italian, German, Swedish and Ukrainian. Spanish has been uttered up there too, thanks not only to Spain sending people but also nations like Mexico and Cuba. Likewise, thanks to Portuguese and Brazilian space exploration, their shared tongue has been spoken in space as well. Space has also found itself with a variety of Asian languages too, tongues such as Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, Mongolian, Arabic and even the tongue of Pashto, thanks to a lone Afghani astronaut, have been spoken in space. This is a huge variety of languages that you don't find mingling all too much with one another on terra firma. This makes space sound like some sort of linguistic paradise, but that really isn't the case. Initially, space travel was fleeting. It consisted of simple trips up and down. While these languages would have been spoken, they weren't exactly thriving as the foundations of a community, like we have seen with languages here on Earth. Language became a more permanent feature in space with the creation of space stations, huge constructions which orbit our Earth and allow people to live in space for extended periods. They mainly exist for carrying out experiments otherwise impossible on Earth. The USSR's Salyut 1 was first launched into orbit in 1971, and since then, many have come and gone from our night sky. Today, the most well known of is the International Space Station or ISS for short, launched in 1998. From its name alone, it's easy to see that this is an international affair, meaning it houses people from all around the planet. One of the more remarkable things about the ISS is how it strips away many of the relations countries may have with one another back on Earth. Astronauts from both the USA and Russia can be found on board. People from nations that were once bitter rivals in their conquest for space now work up there side by side. The ISS is run by the space agencies of the USA and Russia, called NASA and Roscosmos respectively, along with Canada and Japan, called the CSA and JAXA respectively, and the European Space Agency, ESA, which represents many nations across the continent. This means that many of these aforementioned languages have found somewhat more permanent homes on board the ISS, though still not long term, as the average stay on board is only around 6 months. It should also be noted, not only spoken languages have found themselves on board the ISS. The sign language of ASL was used in 2010 when American chemist and astronaut Tracy Cadwell Dyson sent a video message back home to her deaf children. While the ISS doesn't by law have any kind of official language, English is very much the go-to tongue of the station, as all the tech on board is largely operated in that language. This means everyone going to the ISS for any kind of stay has to have a working knowledge of English. They seemingly don't need to be fluent but have to know enough to operate their home for the next few months. This is not the only tongue which is required for the ISS. To reach the station, traditionally astronauts have had to launch on a vessel called a Soyuz spacecraft. This is a Russian creation and is operated in the Slavic tongue. Suffice to say, if the controls of a vessel that's hurtling you into space are all written in Russian, you are going to want to learn Russian. This means that, in addition to English, all residents of the ISS have to have a working knowledge of the tongue of Mother Russia too. Those on board the ISS, as well as having acquired all kinds of qualifications to be there in the first place, also have to learn Russian and English if they don't already speak one or the other. British astronaut Tim Peake said that learning Russian was the toughest part of his training. Space exploration started with Russian and English, and it's these two languages which have persisted to become the most widely spoken in space today. The only issue is that these two languages are incredibly different to one another. While everyone on the ISS has to understand each of them to a degree, very few are perfectly fluent in both. 
This means that a space creole of sort has formed on the ISS, one known as Runglish. As its name implies, Runglish is a combination of English and Russian. In reality, Runglish has been spoken before we ever took to the skies in Russian-speaking communities within the English-speaking world. Yet the idea has become deeply linked to space and the term was adopted by NASA in 2000. This tongue allows those who are more adapted in either English or Russian to converse with one another well enough to get things done in their floating home. Runglish can exist by simply using words of both languages in a single sentence or even adding word-forming elements of either tongue in words of the opposing language. It doesn't seemingly have a defined lexicon as people use this tongue when needed. The ISS is a truly international affair. People from all over the world work side by side with one another as they watch the Earth go by. Though, out of all the languages you will hear on the ISS, something you won't hear is any form of Chinese language. Since they first sent someone into space in 2003, China has become a big player in space. So much so that they have their own space station. The Tiangong space station launched in 2021 and through this and their expanded presence in space, Chinese is the third most spoken language above our heads, even though you won't find it on the ISS. Having earthly words spoken in space can in some ways seem like the zenith of language migration. It's remarkable that tongues formed over thousands of years that have moved across the planet via ships, hooves and our own feet have now found themselves spoken in the great beyond. This is a remarkable collective achievement of humanity and one that all started as a one-upmanship contest between the US and USSR in the mid 20th century. It's truly remarkable that the tongues we created here on Earth have journeyed out into space. And if you've enjoyed this video and want to know more about the migrations of languages not only off our planet but here on Earth too, then you are in luck as this video is actually an animated extract from my latest book, Immigrant Tongues, exploring how languages moved, evolved and defined us. This is a book looking into the history of language migrations, starting all the way back with travels like Latin spread across Europe to more recent journeys like the travels of languages into space. The book comes together to be a history of the world told through language migration and explains why we all speak the languages that we do. It is now available to buy worldwide and there will be links down below. It would make a perfect gift for anyone you know who is into language or history history in general, especially as the gift giving season fast approaches. Hey, you know what? You could even pester someone to buy it for you. Now, if by any chance someone watching this video is going up to the ISS anytime soon, please let me know. I'll happily send you a signed copy of the book to take the space with you. Name Explain depends on viewers like yourself supporting the channel financially on Patreon, so a huge thank you to everyone who does. Donating just $1 a month helps the channel amazingly and gets you bonuses including ad-free videos, exclusive content, the power to request ideas to be made into actual Name Explain videos, and your name at the end of the video with all these awesome people. Visit patreon.com forward slash Name Explain or click the link down below to find out how you too can support the channel. Thank you. Thanks for reaching the end of the video. Why not watch another and subscribe to keep up to date on all things Name Explain? You can find myself on Instagram where I'm Name Explain YT and join the Facebook group Friends of Name Explain to talk with myself and other name nerds. All that will be linked down below. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and once again, thank you all so much.